everybody. I'm Steve, not Trek. Thank you so much for having me and for attending my talk. It's always great as a speaker to have a full room, so thank you for your attention. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, so my, my notes are in a Moleskine, so I'll largely be like reading out of them. I think I'm like legally required to have a Moleskine because I live in Brooklyn. Um, so if you can't see the screen, don't worry too much. It's mostly just like big, it's like pictures more than like a bunch of small text. Um, so so don't, don't stress it too much. Um, I'm here today to talk to you, this time, I'm, I'm giving another talk in like an hour and a half or something. This talk is about JSON API, which is a specification that I co-authored with Yehuda Katz originally, and now we have a couple um, other people involved. But um, first, I'm going to get a couple of, couple of things out of the way. There's two things that I love about the JSON API project, and I like to call them troll marketing features. So the first troll marketing feature is the name itself. There's a certain kind of developer that gets really, really mad that I named my specification in a very generic fashion, and so they talk about it endlessly, which is a good thing. Uh, so like, I have one friend of mine that's like, you made the most difficult spec ever to Google. Oh my god, I'm going to complain about it constantly. And so no, no, uh, you know, nothing is bad press, right? So that's the first thing. The second one is, is if you'll notice, the logo is not actually valid JSON. Uh, you need <laughs> strings, quotes for the strings. And the problem is, is that it just like looked way worse. So we took the quotes out because like that's a nicer looking logo. But it is kind of ironic that like about we're not following the JSON specification in our own logo. So those are that's like the Easter egg um, that I would share with people. Um, okay, so this specification. Um, basically, the idea is this. Who all has argued with other people on their team about the way that you should be using HTTP or your responses in an API before? Right. So that's the way that like pretty much every job I've ever had has mostly been arguing with other developers about like the format of some strings. And that's sort of like satisfying in some sort of visceral way. Like we keep doing this because we get something out of it. But frankly, it's a giant waste of time. Right? So like, there's much, much better things you could do with your time uh, than argue about whether or not you should be using an array or a hash here or like double quotes. Um, I mean, it, not, not in JSON, there's you know, other things. I've had an endless number of style arguments and an endless number of software platforms, right? Double quotes versus single quotes and tabs versus spaces. Obviously, it's spaces. You're just wrong otherwise. Um, <laughs> but like, the point is we feel strongly about these things. And this leads to this phenomenon that we call bike shedding. Um, and so. This, this term comes from an old Usenet post, which Usenet is like back when the internet was really free and you emailed people instead of like using Twitter or whatever. Um, but uh, Paul Henning Camp uh, wrote this blog post called A Bike Shed Any Color Will Do on Greener Grass. And basically, he describes this phenomenon by which um, basically, if you're building a bike shed, the actual building work is the hard part. Um, but it's easier to do things like argue over what color the bike shed should be painted. So the idea of bike shedding, and it's technically called Parkinson's Law of Triviality, which again, now I'm bike shedding the name of bike shedding. Um, it, it means that the more trivial of a change, the more passionate people will feel about it, because anyone can have an opinion about you know, the style of how you format your JSON. Um, that's much easier. It's much harder to argue about like kernel drivers or you know, whatever else, like something that's very, very deep in a technical sense. Um, and so this is a rep reproduction of his email and discussing this phenomenon. Um, and uh, it's at bikeshed.org. And what's amazing is, I'll hit refresh. <laughs> <laughs> the CSS changes randomly in the background uh, every time you load the page. So I love that. Um, the other thing, I'm going to do a little, I, I, I've given this talk a couple of times before and in the past to, uh, to show off how pervasive bike shedding is. Um, I'm going to Google search for bike shedding. Uh, like when I was putting the, the slides together for the first version of this talk, I was like, I need a picture of a bike shed. Um, and unfortunately, Google's kind of ruined my joke a little bit. So this photo right here, let me I'm gonna make this a little bigger. Yeah, a little bit there. So this photo used to be the number one hit on Google for bike shedding. And I was like, you know, this doesn't really look like a bike shed at all, is what I thought to myself. And I went, oh my god, I'm doing it again. Um, so now. Now Google's fixed it. This, this looks much more like what I expect a bike shed to be, but the whole point is that we shouldn't be spending our time arguing over what the bike shed looks like. We should be spending our time building stuff. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history uh, before I talk about the specifics of the spec. But basically, um, I have done a lot of work in the Ruby world. Most of my professional work is in Ruby. Um, I used to have commit to Ruby on Rails. I uh, like literally have a Ruby tattooed on my body, also a Pearl Camel. Um, but 
I was doing all this work on Rails, and Rails has been one of the best and worst things to ever happen to rest, dare I utter those words, uh, because it sort of gave this impression that we have to build things in a certain way, but it like did it only halfway. So people care about URLs, but not about the structure of your JSON or like anything beyond that. And I, I think it was really important. It taught a lot of people um, that like, we used to hear a long time ago in the API development community that like developers aren't smart enough to know more than Git and post. So don't even worry about these other HTTP verbs. And this is something I, I'm relatively young, uh, but um, I've heard this over and over throughout my short career where people say like, oh, but the average developer is too dumb to get X. And then like five years later, X becomes the norm that every developer knows. So nowadays people are very familiar that there are more HTTP verbs than um, get and post. Uh, and they know about two more of them, but there's actually a bunch more. Um, and so we're sort of like collectively, we are all learning more and more about APIs as we build them um, and build them more and more at scale. And so the problem about this is that if you have spent time studying the massive HTTP specification, and by now we have this new thing that was called HTTP BIS, but has since actually become a real RFC. So instead of the good old fashioned single HTTP RFC, we now have seven of them, and they're all like twice as long as they were before. Uh, so yeah, so if you wanna be like an HTTP nerd, you have to do a lot of reading of really boring specification work, and then you get to enjoy the pleasure of arguing with other developers about their particular interpretation. Like, I was raised very Catholic, and I'm not religious anymore, but like arguing over the text of RFCs with other people like reminds me of like arguing over Bible verses. Like this is like, but my interpretation of what this passage says, like fielding 316 clearly states that like X, Y, Z. Um, anyway, so at the same time as I was doing this work on Rails and this API thing, um, Yehuda Katz, amongst others, were starting this project called Ember.js, which you may have heard of. Um, this framework for creating ambitious web applications. Yehuda was here and gave a little bit of talk about Ember earlier. But what he was concerned about, um, Yehuda also came out of the Ruby world, and he was concerned about Ember as a JavaScript framework being too tied to Ruby. Because, you know, what good is a JavaScript framework if it's specific, uh, if it's not like backend agnostic, right? Like the whole point of it being on the client is that you can use it with any server side technology. And so he really didn't want Ember to be tied to Rails, but he hadn't really figured out how to accomplish that, that, that yet. Uh, four hours of arguing later, I had convinced him that <laughs> what, uh, what he needed to do was there's this natural boundary between services. So when you're, when you're designing any kind of system, what really, really matters is the interface. And this matters in your source code, it matters between, you know, if you have like uh, a just a front end and a back end, or if you have like 30,000 services, like is cool all these days with the kids and such. <laughs> um, you need to define those interfaces so that your stuff actually works some of the time. Um, and so I was like, there's this natural boundary between the client and the server, and we, we have a language for that, HTTP, and uh, as much as I sometimes don't like JSON, it's kind of what everybody's using nowadays, uh, we are really adamant that we're gonna reinvent the entire XML ecosystem in JSON, so we're like three quarters of the way done with that by now, so it's like pretty much okay. And, uh, and I was like, but the problem is, is that you want Ember to be agnostic, so we should define the JSON that you expect to emit on the server side and the JSON that you expect to consume on the client side. And when you have a good interface, that's what lets you swap out components in a system. So if we have this middle layer well-defined, you could then use a different framework instead of Ember on the front end, or you could use a different framework other than Rails on the back end, and you get modularity. Um, and as a positive side note out of that, we can stop arguing over the like sort of it's weird to call JSON low level, but like if you're building an application, the structure of your data is mostly a sort of low level detail in the sense that you, know, you may care about certain things because of efficiency or whatever, but you're primarily concerned with building an interface on top of whatever data that is, rather than really truly worrying about the exact format of the data. And some people need to worry about that. Obviously there's different roles in an organization, but like, um, if, you're, if you're the one that's on the front end team, you don't really wanna have to stress out about arguing about the way that things are structured. Um, and I've heard from a lot of teams now where um, like people that are originally front end people that are starting to learn about back end, then this becomes like a little bit of discordance because the back end people are like mad that these new people are getting involved in what they're doing and there's, I don't know. Node is wonderful but also has some complexities um, involved. 
So uh, what we did was we basically took the output that Rails kind of generated originally, um, and then we started looking for flaws and looking where it was weak, and uh, we sort of wrote up this specification uh, and published it in May of 2013. So it's been sort of like two years that we've been uh, working at this. And um, so basically uh, this spec is sort of the result of that. It doesn't look a whole lot of like what Rails uh, used to spit out where we sort of started because um, as we built applications on top of things and we tried to implement the spec clean instead of just looking at Rails, it became evident that there were a number of different weaknesses in the way that Rails did these kind of things. And you know, the way that Rails generated JSON was just kind of like whatever the people felt like generating stuff at the time. It wasn't really thought out from like, what does a client need? Like, uh, you know, the uh, DHH is notoriously anti-JavaScript frameworks. And so like he's not really designing things with an eye towards what JavaScript frameworks need out of servers. Um, and so we sort of evolved from then. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the exact details of the spec, but I also wanna talk about like standards. So I described this as a specification or a standard. And so um, a lot of people are like, well, who says it's standard? Um, and that's a good question. It turns out that the way the internet is run is based on a lot of different organizations that have a lot of different standards. And so JSON API specifically is currently at the place, we got this awesome uh, registered media types. This is the IANA's website where you can register types. So uh, we got this application vnd.api plus JSON. Um, it's funny because uh, one of the people that's mad about that generic name is actually Roy Fielding. He's since said that he would like have rejected this had he noticed the paperwork going through, so <laughs> snuck it in there. Yes. Um, but uh, anyway, so this is the first step towards becoming like an RFC, basically, is you, you define a media type and then it gets this VND prefix. Um, and then after you've seen a lot of people um, develop it in the field, you eventually submit an RFC and then go through the RFC process. So that's kind of like where we're at. And we do intend to pursue an IETF um, RFC probably in like a year or two. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge like where your technology is on the maturity curve so that people know. Um, however, like I said, we've already put about two years worth of effort um, into this. Yeah, I guess I realize that text is super small. Thanks IETF. Yeah, there we go. There's my email. Um, VND.API plus JSON is like the technical um, name. So that's sort of where we're at in the, in the overall process of standardization. Um, so we do everything, this particular website, um, which is yeah, jsonapi.org, uh, is all hosted um, on GitHub under this JSON API organization. So that's where we do a lot of this um, work. Uh, we just, today, someone left a comment on one of the things that we're working on right now for um, some future editions. And they said, by the way, have the 3,000th star. So we're now uh, over 3,000 stars on GitHub, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, I don't know, I like monotonically increasing integers just as much as everybody else does. <laughs> well, hopefully monotonic anyway, cross my fingers. Um, now some people are gonna go unstar it to spite me. But, um, so yeah, so we have, this is where we do most of our actual work on the specification is done um, through discussions in uh, issues and then pull requests to actually modify uh, the text or I guess there's, you know, CSS tweaks of course because CSS is hard. Um, and then also, uh, we have a discuss, um, a discourse instance that uh, you can like talk about and get help from people. And so this is more for people that are implementing and building stuff with the specification. So if you have like user level questions rather than um, like wanting to improve the spec level questions, uh, you can check out our, um, our discuss instance and talk about it on there. Um, okay, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about tools that you can use. I, so, I'll talk a little bit about the spec in a moment, but frankly, like explaining the structure of JSON is a really boring conference talk. I don't wanna bore you all. So I'm not gonna to talk too, too much about what it looks like, but I wanna show you this because a great example of what it looks like is um, Endpoints is a framework built on top of Node.js. Um, and I know framework is like a dirty word in the JavaScript community for some reason. So it's not a framework, it's a loosely collected pile of libraries. It's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like Node and then Berkshelf and then uh, you can either use Happy or Express. I prefer Express uh, and then endpoints on top of that. So don't worry, it's not a monolithic framework. It's definitely a collection of like 50 zillion modules. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, on their homepage, they decided to do it by actually like using the spec for all the links. So uh, that's kind of cool. But let me make this a little bigger. Oh yeah, responsive design. It, gets, it shrinks all of a sudden. So uh, 
is kind of an example. Um, so this framework lets you build up uh, servers really, really easily, and I've enjoyed working with it, even though I'm frankly really terrible at JavaScript. But um, this is sort of what the what a, um, a format of the data actually ends up looking like. So uh, we do certain things like uh, all of the data here is under this particular key, data. And at first, you might be like, well, why are your names facing this? And it turns out that when you get into more complicated situations with like side loading, additional resources and stuff, you kind of wish that you had that namespace. And so one of the things that can happen is you try the simplest possible thing, you end up painting yourself into a corner, and then you have to like develop all these um, you know, edge case things. So it's just, I guess, like one example of the kind of stuff um, that we've done. But uh, I'm gonna show you a slightly better example is the one on the homepage. Let me shrink this back down before I get rid of it. Um, so because we come like historically from the Rails world, uh, this is an example of a blog uh, and a blog post. Um, being represented through this JSON. So one of the other things, um, and this is like technically optional, but we like to uh, promote it, is we do uh, use hypermedia um, because that is sort of the OG, again, REST shenanigans. Uh, I like to remind people that gzip, gzip uh, compression uh, relies on repetition to shrink things down. So all these URLs get super, super compressed. Um, but the point is, is that we have uh, like related links uh, and then the actual data, so in this case it's an array of article objects and they have a type and an ID and then their attributes, their relationships to other things. So for example, uh, this article has uh, comments. So here's like, well, and in this case it's first is the author. So um, it has relationships to an author. Uh, I'll make this a little teeny bit bigger. Can I make it? That's all the bigger I got. Okay, so there's like relationships to an author um, with links to their information uh, and their particular information, um, links to comments um, and all that stuff. And then we have, uh, for example, so one of the common complaints about the way that people naively do REST is they assume that one URL equals one row in a database table. So if you wanna like fetch a blog post and 35 comments, you're gonna be making 36, can I do math? 36 uh, HTTP requests. But we have the ability to do things like side-loading resources. You can say like, please give me this post and then also give me the related comments so you can just fetch it all at once. Um, and so this is an example of here we have um, a person who has made a particular comment and here is uh, this comment. Of course, the first comment is first, as is traditional. Uh, any slash daughters, old slash daughters in the room? Um, and then, uh, you know, all their other stuff. Yeah, I like XML better, um, whatever. Uh, so the point is, is that uh, we have all of this stuff and it's specifically kind of designed for the use case of I have some objects on the server and the client, I would like to share between them efficiently. So we have like batching stuff and like I said side loading and all these kind of things. And so this might look a little more complicated uh, at first then your simple kind of just like spit out whatever serialized to JSON gives you. But we've done a lot of thinking um, about how this structure actually works and how to make it work for the particular use case of what is very common in single page apps, just shuffling things back and forth. Um, so Ember Data uh, is the library in Ember that uh, handles doing um, this kind of thing. And it's able to do intelligent things like you can tell it to batch up five or six changes and then send them all at once instead of making one particular HTTP request and like all these kinds of things. So um, while it is a little bit more complex initially, um, it is significantly simpler once you're trying to do more advanced things and let's face it, we all end up doing more advanced things. I don't know why this CSS is now, apparently when I shrink and then make it big, it's like, all right, whatever. Um, there we go. Uh, so anyway, the other thing about the JSON being actually a little bit complex is that we also have things like, I just showed you that um, endpoints for Node, but there's actually a significant number of other implementations. So here is just a scroll. I'm just gonna scroll through this list because it's big and that's a good way to convey that there are a lot of libraries. So we got like JavaScript and iOS and Ruby and some PHP. Wait, that's on a client? Oh yeah, right, cool. Um, PHP stuff on a client validation. Um, and then like, you know, Node and tons of PHP, Ruby, Python, Go, um, you know, Java, um, all these sort of things. Uh, and so what's, what's really nice about conventions, um, and the reason why conventions matter, is that I hope that you never need to care about any of this whatsoever. 
Um, my dream is that by following these conventions, we bear, build shared tooling. Because frankly, I authored this spec, but I don't have to think about it. Like, part of the reason I wrote all this stuff down is because it's easy to forget, and like, I'll misremember what I was intending to do, so I go back and read my own spec. People ask me questions, and I'm like, uh, I gotta go reread the spec, and they're like, don't you know this? You authored it, and it's like, well, that's the, the reason we write things down is to give them like more permanence. So, um, so I don't intend that you, as a developer, need to really care about this. Um, by creating conventions and by sharing these specifications, we can build tooling and then you can just use a library to generate all this stuff. So for example, with endpoints, um, you define your models and uh, then you tell them like, okay, these are the whitelist of URLs that I want and then it just handles doing all this stuff for you. You don't have to worry about doing the actual development of things like side loading and all that other stuff. Um, and this is true of the, all of the other, I'm, I'm mostly a server side dev to be honest, so I know more about the generating of this JSON than about the consuming of it. Um, but, uh, you know, so the idea is that you'll use libraries um, instead, and that way you don't have to worry about uh, arguing about all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's something else that I want to like impress that's important, and one of the reasons why I think that conventions really matter, because conventions are what allow you to build tools. Um, if we didn't have conventions, we'd have to build brand new tools for every single thing possible. And um, this is also something why we've seen a lot of interest in this specification from people that do consulting. Because if you're developing new APIs for your clients, you don't just have the pleasure of arguing over an API for your product. You have, an ar you have the pleasure of arguing over and over and over again every couple of weeks about every new product that your consulting firm is actually doing. So um, we've seen a lot of interest in people uh, in that particular space because then you can learn those tools and use them again on multiple APIs, um, which is also really nice. Um, and so, yeah, so the more, the more things, uh, maybe you know, this is a little anti-Brooklyn, I guess, but I don't want hipster, bespoke, artisanal, handcrafted, farm-to-table APIs. <laughs> I want like manufactured, churn them out, really, really simple, just like push the button and the assembly line like chunks them out kind of um, APIs. Because uh, I think that for most of the products that we build, uh, you don't actually need the handcrafted artisanal shenanigans. Um, and sometimes that's nice, and there's nothing the matter with enjoying things that are special and made by hand. Um, just like, you know, oftentimes you're trying to actually build stuff. Um, so, thanks. Uh, <laughs> it's like a loud <laughs> clapping over the other room. Um, so uh, I myself have been developing this little application um, that, that I've been building stuff on. Uh, it turns out, so I have like tattoos all under these sleeves and um, my oldest friend in the world is married to a tattoo artist and she does all of his like business administration work. And um, one time when I was like visiting, um, I saw her messing around with Google Docs. And I was like, what are you doing, Mel? And she's like, oh, I'm scheduling Jason's appointments. And this person who had like, uh, doesn't have a GED and like never finished high school, had reinvented third normal form and joins and had created her own database inside of Google Docs and then was doing all that work by hand to like manage appointments. And I was like, Mel, please, this is the reason the software is invented so that you don't have to do this kind of menial labor. Please let me just do this for you. Um, and so in exchange for getting free tattoos, I now built uh, like a CRM for them. Um, and so that's cool. Uh, it's great on their end because unlimited tattoos is really limited. Like I only have so much skin, right? So I can't. Uh, although one of the other guys in the shop does do like really beautiful white tattoos on top of black. So people come in for the first appointment and they'll black out everything and they'll put white on top. Anyway, that's not the point. Um, the point is, is that like any good programmer, I hacked together a prototype uh, in a weekend, and then now I've been supporting it for the last two years in production. Uh, and, like, it's, it's, uh, yeah, well, I got, I got about 45 hours in this sleeve and then some other stuff on this side, but um, the, uh, it's hacked together to the point where like, there are no user accounts. The, the username and password is like hard coded in the source code because I was just like, just ship it, right? Get it out the door. Um, and so now I've been rebuilding it all in JavaScript, which is of course totally not hacked together in any capacity. Um, <laughs> and so I have this nice little, uh, you know, like Ember, um, Ember app with, you know, whatever else on the side and it's super snappy and fine. And so like I've been developing, you know, my own little product um, using the spec. So I'm eating my own dog food to mix metaphors of bike shedding and dog food. I don't know, yeah. Um, <laughs> And so uh, all that stuff is super open source um, as well because everything I do is open source. So um, I got the you know, Ember app and the, the back end here 
um, as I've been working on a project to make sure that I'm not just like that guy telling you how to build APIs without actually doing it myself. Um, so this, this Redux is hopefully gonna launch pretty soon. I keep going to conferences instead of actually finishing my product off, so I gotta, I gotta spend some time and do that. Um, but yeah, so that's the history, um, that's the specification. Uh, we, like I said, we started this in 2013, and in those two years, we had a lot of people implement stuff, and they pointed out flaws, and so we changed the specification a bunch, um, and actually, over those couple of years, it went through a radical amount of change. Um, this is very common for any project that um, Yehuda or I are a part of, is that like 1.0 is 1.0, so pre-1.0, anything can happen, and lots of stuff does, and so what's unfortunate is a lot of people take versioning numbers to sort of mean like, this is pseudo-stable just because I'm using it, so um, sometimes there's some angst because uh, there's like massive changes, and this happened with Ember as well. Before 1.0, everything was changing like constantly. Um, but uh, May 15th, uh, no, that's the Rust 1.0 release date. It was the month before. Like all of my projects went 1.0 within this like three month period. I don't know why I scheduled this like myself. Um, sometime in March, March, April, or May, um, we went 1.0 with the JSON API spec. And so it is now no longer changing in a backwards and incompatible way forever. We are committed to our sins and we'll deal with them for the rest of our lives. Um, and so uh, we gained that experience from that churn, but now is time for stability and for people to build real actual things on top of this. Um, so uh, there has been a lot of uptake. Um, Ember 2.0 now actually uses this as the default format that it expects. So, um, and that happened uh, a couple months ago, so we've seen a large number of people um, get involved since that's kind of like pushing this along a little bit. Um, and I've said Ember and Rails a lot, but we've also had a significant number of people who do not do either of those things. Um, I used to work at a company in San Francisco, but like most companies used to is the verb there, uh, which we did a million dollars a day in credit card transactions through uh, API based on JSON API, so it's definitely seen a lot of use um, unfortunately, VC money runs out someday. Um, but it wasn't because of the quality of their API. It was because San, San Francisco was a weird and messed up place. Um, uh, yeah, totally. Uh, completely unlike Brooklyn. Brooklyn's clearly perfect. Um, no, I'm trying to move to Berlin like sometime, like everybody in Brooklyn. We joke that like all the people that are in Brooklyn want to move to Berlin, and then all the people in Berlin want to move to Prague, whatever. Um, <laughs> nobody's ever happy. Uh, so yeah, so we're seeing a bunch of adoption, um, we're building useful tools, uh, we're helping reduce these kinds of stupid arguments and letting you focus on product, and so uh, I hope that this sort of interests you and I'd love to have you get involved or hear your feedback or like talk about all these things. So um, that's what I have to share with you today, so thank you so much.